Welcome to another lesson as we cover brain tumors. What are brain tumors? Well, brain tumors can develop in any section of the brain, take up space within the skull and are classed based on the cell or tissue that gave rise to them. The most frequent type of tumor is a brain tumor. There are two types of brain tumors, benign and malignant. Malignant gliomas, neoglial cells, benign meningiomas, meninges, pituitary adenomas and auditory neuromas are only a few examples. Acoustic cranial nerve. Supratentorial tumors are tumors that develop above the tentorium cerebelli in the cerebral hemispheres. Infratentorial tumors are those that occur below the tentorium cerebelli, such as tumors of the brainstem and cerebellum. Brain tumors press against surrounding brain tissue, causing decreased cerebrospinal fluid outflow, increased intracranial pressure, cerebral edema and neurologic impairments. Endocrine dysfunction can be caused by tumors of the pituitary gland. Malignant brain tumors are linked to a high rate of overall mortality. Neuroglial tissue is the source of primary malignant brain tumors, which seldom spread outside of the brain. Secondary malignant brain tumors are metastases from a primary cancer that has spread to other parts of the body. Breast, kidney, lung, skin, melanomas and gastrointestinal tract malignancies are the most common causes of cranial metastatic lesions. Benign brain tumors develop from the meninges or cranial nerves and do not metastasize. These tumors have distinct boundaries and cause damage either by the pressure they exert within the cranial cavity and or by impairing the function of the cranial nerve. Health promotion, disease prevention. There are no routine screening procedures to detect brain tumors. Assessment. Risk factors. The cause is unknown, but several risk factors have been identified. Genetics, environmental agents, exposure to ionizing radiation, previous head injury. Expected findings. Physical assessment findings include the following. Dysarthria, dysphagia, positive Romberg sign, positive Babinski sign, vertigo, hemiparesis, cranial nerve dysfunction, Examples are inability to discriminate sounds, loss of gag reflex, loss of blink response, pepaledema. Manifestations specific to supratentorial brain tumors include severe headache, worse upon awakening but improving over time, worsened by coughing or straining, visual changes, blurring, visual field deficit, focal or generalized seizures, loss of voluntary movement or the inability to control movement, change in cognitive function, memory loss, language impairment, change in personality, inability to control emotions, nausea with or without vomiting, paralysis. Manifestations specific to infratentorial brain tumors include hearing loss or ringing in the ear, visual changes, facial drooping, difficulty swallowing, nystagmus, crossed eyes or decreased vision, autonomic nervous system dysfunction, ataxia or clumsy movement, hemiparesis, cranial nerve dysfunction, inability to discriminate sounds, loss of gag reflex, loss of blink response. Laboratory tests. CBC and differential to rule out anemia or malnutrition. Blood alcohol and toxicology screen to rule out these as possible causes of altered physical assessment findings. Diagnostic procedures include the following. X-ray, computed tomography, CT imaging scan, magnetic resonance imaging, MRI, brain scan, positron emission tomography, PET scan, and cerebral angiography are used to determine the size, location, and extent of the tumor. Lumbar puncture, LP, and electroencephalography, EEG can provide additional information about the tumor. LP should not be done if the client has or shows manifestations of increasing intracranial pressure ICP, to prevent brain herniation. Lab tests can be done to evaluate endocrine function, renal status and electrolyte balance. Cerebral biopsy identifies cellular pathology. 
This procedure can be performed in the surgical suite or in a radiology specialty suite. Diagnostic procedure can be used to guide the biopsy, such as a CT or MRI scan. Image guiding systems, which use CT or MRI scan information, can be used in the surgical suite. A piece of cerebral tissue that appears abnormal on the CT or MRI scan is obtained. This tissue is then sent to pathology, where diagnostic tests are performed. Benefit Biopsy is minimally disruptive to the rest of the brain, provides a decreased recovery time and is not associated with the risks of an open craniotomy. Negative. Biopsy does not remove or debulk the tumor. The diagnostic determination by pathology can be inconclusive related to insufficient tissue and a misdiagnosis can occur if the tumor contains many types of tissue or the specimen is taken from one site. Client education. If the client is on anti-epileptic medications, these must be continued to prevent seizure activity. If on aspirin products, these should be discontinued at least 72 hours prior to the procedure to minimize the risk of intracerebral bleeding. Other medications can be withheld prior to the procedure. Normally, pre-procedure activities can be resumed after recovering from the general anesthetic. Care of the incision should include keeping the area clean and dry. If sutures are in place, they need to be removed one to seven days later. Driving or other dangerous activities should be avoided until follow-up appointment occurs and diagnosis is known. Patient-centered care nursing care. Maintain airway, monitor oxygen levels, administer oxygen as needed and monitor lung sounds. Monitor neurologic status, in particular assessing for changes in level of consciousness, neurologic deficits and occurrence of seizures. Maintain client safety, for example, assist with transfers and ambulation and provide assistive devices as needed. Implement seizure precautions. Administer medications. Medications. Non-opioid analgesics are used to treat headaches. Opioid medications are avoided because they tend to decrease the level of consciousness. Corticosteroids are used to reduce cerebral edema, relieving headaches, improving altered levels of consciousness. Corticosteroid medications quickly reduce cerebral edema and can be rapidly administered to maximize their effectiveness. Chronic administration is used to control cerebral edema associated with the presence or treatment of benign or malignant brain tumors. Osmotic diuretics decrease the fluid content of the brain, resulting in a decrease in intracranial pressure. Anticonvulsant medications are used to control or prevent seizure activity. Anticonvulsant medications suppress the neuronal activity within the brain, which prevents seizure activity. H2 antagonists are used to decrease the acid content of the stomach, reducing the risk of stress ulcers. H2 antagonists are administered during acute or stressful periods, such as after surgery, at the initiation of chemotherapy, or during the first several radiation therapy treatments. Antiemetics are used if nausea, with or without vomiting, is present. Nausea and vomiting can be present as a result of the increased ICP, the site of the tumor or the treatment required. These medications are administered as prescribed and can be provided as a preventative intervention, especially when the treatment is associated with nausea and vomiting. Chemotherapy can be given in conjunction with radiation. However, the blood-brain barrier can prevent adequate doses from reaching the tumor. Interprofessional care. Initiate appropriate referrals, social services, support groups, medical equipment and physical, speech and occupational therapy. Treatments include steroids, surgery, chemotherapy, conventional radiation therapy, stereotactic radiosurgery and clinical trials. Chemotherapy and conventional radiation therapy can be administered prior to surgery to reduce the bulk of the tumor or after surgery to prevent tumor recurrence. In most cases, when the tumor is benign, surgery is a curative treatment. However, these tumors can regrow. 
radiation and chemotherapy can be provided to prevent a recurrence. Some tumors can be malignant by location, meaning that while the pathology is benign, the location makes the mortality rate associated with them high. In cases where the tumor is a metastatic lesion from a primary lesion elsewhere in the body, treatments are palliative. These treatments can consist of surgery, radiation and chemotherapy in any combination and are aimed at controlling intracerebral lesions. Therapeutic procedures Craniotomy Complete or partial resection of brain tumor through a surgical opening in the skull. Preoperative nursing actions Explain the procedure to the client, answering all appropriate questions and providing emotional support. Questions regarding the surgery and its outcomes should be written in an effort to ensure all questions are answered. The client's partner should be present to hear the responses and avoid miscommunication. If the client takes aspirin, this medication needs to be stopped at least 72 hours prior to the procedure. No alcohol, tobacco, anticoagulants or NSAIDs for 5 days prior to surgery. If the client uses alternative complementary medications or treatments, make these known to the provider. A living will and durable power for healthcare decisions should be completed. Administer medications as prescribed. An anti-anxiety or muscle relaxant medication can be administered if requested and provided by the provider. Post-operative nursing actions. Closely monitor vital signs and neurologic status including using the Glasgow scale. Treat pain adequately. Elevate the head of the client 30 degrees for clients who had supratentorial surgery and are in a neutral position to prevent increased ICP. Turn the client to the side or supine to decrease the risk of pressure injuries and pneumonia. Infratentorial craniotomy clients lie flat and side-lying. Turn side to side every 2 hours for 24 to 48 hours. Straining activities, for example, moving up in bed or attempting to have a bowel movement, should be avoided to prevent increased ICP. Post-operative bleeding and seizure activity are the greatest risks. Periorbital edema and ecchymosis is not unusual. Treat with cold compresses. Assess head dressing every 1-2 to two hours for drainage. Complications Syndrome of inappropriate antidiuretic hormone Syndrome of inappropriate antidiuretic hormone is a condition where fluid is retained as a result of an overproduction of vasopressin or antidiuretic hormone from the posterior pituitary gland. SIADH occurs when the hypothalamus has been damaged and can no longer regulate the release of ADH. Treatment consists of fluid restriction, administration of oral conivaptin and treatment of hyponatremia with 3% hypertonic saline solution for severe cases. If SIADH is present, the client can have disorientation, headache, vomiting, muscle weakness, decreased LLC, irritability, loss of thirst and weight gain. If severe or untreated, this condition can cause seizures and a coma. Diabetes insipidus Diabetes insipidus is seen most often after supratentorial surgery, especially when involving the pituitary gland or hypothalamus. This is a condition where large amounts of urine are excreted as a result of deficiency of ADH from the posterior pituitary gland. The condition occurs when the hypothalamus has been damaged and can no longer regulate the release of ADH. Treatment of DI consists of massive fluid replacement administration of synthetic vasopressin, careful attention to laboratory values and replacement of essential nutrients as indicated. That ends the lesson on brain tumors. Check out our other nursing videos to help make studying easier. Also, see below for useful links that take you to free NCLEX-style quizzes, nursing study guides and more.